so we're here to talk about how not to measure latency, uh, some of the common mistakes that I've seen in the field and how to try to avoid them. Um, we're going to cover a few subjects. Uh, we're going to go through some latency behavior background, talk about how people measure latency and why, um, talk about the pitfalls or mistakes people do around using statistics, or what I call statistics, uh, to try and understand how latency behaves. Uh, look at some philosophical questions. Why we measure latency, why different applications need different things from latency, how to state requirements. Um, and then look at a problem I call the coordinate and emission problem, one that I think happens at about eight out of 10 environments I've seen measured. Um, we'll, talk, uh, we'll look at some useful tools, some open source things that you could use to perhaps help in measurement. And um, then I'll spend a little time bragging using those tools and showing you how Correct measurement actually lets you see the goodness of certain behaviors. Um, I'm Gil Tenney. I'm the CTO of Azul Systems, a company I started a little over a decade ago. I've been working on virtual machines and garbage collection for that time. This is me working in my kitchen on garbage collection. That's an actual trash compactor that wasn't working right. But I've also worked on software garbage collection, uh, actual algorithms that are published, and I've built a lot of different things from hardware and telco systems and firewalls all the way up to this. Um, at Azul, we build scalable virtual machines. Um, we basically uh, do that and nothing else, and we had the approach of doing whatever it takes to do that, including building our own hardware. We've built hardware for um, three successive generations that had massive scale, 864 cores, three quarters of a terabyte in memory in this picture. Uh, but we did that because we had to. There was no hardware we could use that could achieve that scale. And about four or five years ago, we saw the commodity roadmaps from Intel and AMD to some degree uh, becoming good enough that we don't have to build our own hardware to do this anymore. Today, Azul makes software, pure software for commodity x86 product. We call it Zing. It's a Java virtual machine that basically can bring two commodity servers the kind of scale in memory, the kind of responsiveness and consistency that used to require custom hardware. We're known for low latency, consistent responsiveness, and big memory. Uh, but but um, more than that, we're across the board, we fix the behavior of things like Java virtual machines for uh, many types of applications. Um, talked about some fallacies, or let's talk about some fallacies. <coughs> um, the first one is that people think that application code runs continuously. We tend to naturally believe that, but the reality is it keeps stopping. It stops between every two instructions, because that's a basic quantum. But interrupts happen, power savings mode happen, errors happen, um, scheduling happens, context switching happens. And up the software stack, we have bigger and bigger signals that mostly result in big disruptions and stoppage of execution. Um, response time is not something you measure by taking the amount of work you did and looking at the amount of time it took and dividing one by the other. That's not response time. And measuring it uh, actually at beginning and end of operations is needed. Um, response time also virtually never, and I've never seen a software system that exhibits an actual normal distribution. I've seen hardware-based systems that do. But in, in hardware and software-based systems, the fact that there are these incontinuities in time and stoppages mean that normal distribution virtually never happens. And the last one is that glitches or these stoppages are often assumed to be small noise factors that don't truly affect our results. But, um, and, and as a result, people tend to ignore them and think they don't really matter. Um, all these statements are wrong, and they're strongly wrong. They affect how people measure. So if we look at response time to behavior and how people tend to think about them, this is a slide from a, a Kix documentation for IBM servers. Um, we generally think of response time as something that depends on load. And the higher the load is, the worse it gets. There's a good range, and there's a middle range, and there's a terrible range. And you usually want to be in the good range. But we know that if we overload a system, response time will start suffering. The thing is that people think that's the main thing that controls response time, and that's very wrong. So to start with, when we talk about response time or latency, what are we talking about? 
Are we talking about the average response time, the maximum response time, some percentile of response time? It, what it is that we're, we want to measure uh, matters a lot, and how it behaves will vary. We also have an implicit assumption that load is the primary thing that controls response time behavior. So let's look at some samples. I went to the internet, said response time graph, and I got one of these. And this is a good example of a graph where this uh, blue line that goes up in steps, that's the load. That's the number of users actually on the system. And this black line is the response time, actually an average over a small period of time plotted. If, if you see anything in this graph, it's that the black line and the blue line have very little correlation, or at least at the top parts, these have nothing to do with load. We have situations where we have very high response time that is much higher than a response time that later happens at a lower load. So clearly, load is not what's affecting that. Now, to some degree, it is. You can see that the bottom of this black line kind of tracks the blue line. But these things are what really matters. These are the things you'll actually feel. And I usually call these hiccups. You can call them all kinds of things, stalls, stoppages, long operations. And I honestly don't know in this system what's causing them. But you see them in all, almost all software systems if you actually look at response time over time. Another example of hiccups would be this. Um, now, here you have some very nice, clear hiccups. And and a simple cause for these hiccups is that this is a very artificial system I ran, and I hit Control Z and counted till 10, and then let it go again, and hit Control Z and counted till 10. This is me stopping a system. The reason for the hiccup doesn't matter. It's just that they do happen, and measuring whether or not they happen and looking at the results over time rather than an average or one number is very important to capture and understand the behavior of a system. Here's a measurement from an actual low latency system. And to give you a feel for how dominant the hiccups are, the 99th percentile of this system was 60 microseconds. But these hiccups are 30,000% higher than that. They are hundreds of standard deviations away from the mean. And they dominate the behavior of the system. In every five second interval of the system, there was something really big happening that was far, far away from the average. So knowing that they happen and measuring it is important. So these hiccups that I'm talking about are typically strongly multimodal. Uh, what I mean by that is that they look anything but a standard deviation or standard distribution. And they usually look like periodic freezes and then really good behavior. It's really good freeze, good freeze. And the only question is how big are the freezes. There are usually multiple modes in the software is actually switching between one mode and another, where there's a common good mode, your typical fastest behavior, or typical behavior. Then there's a somewhat bad mode, and then there's a terrible mode, and hopefully that's it, but there might be additional modes. And understanding the modes is important. Um, a common way to deal with uh, hiccups in the industry is to do this. It's a very good technique, by the way. Um, and, and let me give you instructions on how to do that, other than taking a shovel and digging. Um, you take out your calculator and you produce standard deviation numbers. And it's really, really, it's a great way of, of completely ignoring the actual behavior and giving you results that, that's wishful thinking and gives you a number to hang on and a behavior to hang on, and then everybody assumes that it's true. This is virtually always wrong. Like I said, I've not met a software system where this represents the actual behavior of it. And the easiest way to sanity check this, by the way, is if you look at the maximum number in your results and you look at the median, and if the distance between those is more than five standard deviations, the standard deviation is meaningless. Now, like I said, I've virtually never seen a software system where that ratio isn't bigger than that. Um, to give you a specific example, I've actually spoken with people who've told me that they can derive the 99th percentile from this behavior. Because see, the 99th percentile is roughly three standard deviations away from the mean. So if you've collected the mean and you've established your distribution, you can compute any percentile, right? That would be true only if you actually had a normal distribution. And since that's not the case, usually all those computations are just garbage in, garbage out. 
Now, there are better ways to do this, and as an example of a better way to do it, it's actually measuring percentiles and stating requirements. So this would be an example of the, the actual percentile at every level. And by the way, you can see multiple modes, a good mode, a somewhat bad mode, and a terrible mode. Um, and this is an example of stating requirements on percentiles, saying that you want to see certain behavior at certain levels and certain percentages. Um, when we look at these requirements, it's important to understand that they depend on your application, and different applications have very, very different drives for requirements. Now let's look at why it is that we measure latency. Latency tells us how long something took, one thing took. That's a simple measurement. We know what that is. And, and how, how do we want latency to behave, or you know, what do we want it to be? The answer is almost always good and fast, right? And nobody says, I want it to be slow. But when we look at multiple results, we have to say how we want the behavior of all those results to be. We could say we want them to always be fast. We, always, we want them to always be zero, but there's usually a cost involved in that, often one we're not willing to pay. So we need to be realistic, and we need to specify what we actually need and what we'll actually accept, and that differs across applications. There is usually going to be a set of requirements that you can state that matter to your application. There's usually a pass-fail criteria you can describe, where if you've done this, it's good enough, and if you don't, it's broken and I need to fix it. Um, and different applications have different basic motivations for this. If the requirements reflect what the application needs, and the measurements actually measure what the requirements specified, we may have a chance of actually having data uh, give us good reasons for decisions. So let's look at examples of applications that are motivation. Um, I use models of, you know, examples. For example, the Olympics. In the Olympics, you have a simple goal. I like this to, uh, I like to call this the ring the bell first application. You see it in some forms of trading as well. The goal is simple. You want to win a gold medal, and nothing else matters. Okay. Um, to do that, you have to be better than everybody else in at least some races. It's okay to be slower, sometimes, but you have to be the absolute fastest than anybody else. There's no, you know, second place doesn't get anything, or if you care only about gold medals, at least it doesn't. Um, it's the, the worst case doesn't matter, the 99th percentile doesn't matter, and it's okay to not even finish. It's okay to completely fail as long as in some races you win. And that leads to different strategies. Some people might say, I'm really good at one thing, I'll race that one thing. Some people might say, I've trained all year, I've got a lot of stamina, I'm going to run in eight races and hope to win one of them. There are different ways to apply this. And again, this applies to not just the Olympics, but a lot of real-world strategies. But in this case, it's your minimum time, it's your best time that matters, and that's the only thing that you're actually working on, it's not the averages, it's not the maximums, it's not the standard deviations, certainly they don't actually affect whether or not you win gold medals. You don't get a medal for being fastest on the average. Another good example of a real-world type motivation is pacemakers. This is what hard real-time usually looks like. And hard real-time usually has strong, very strong, often life and death requirements. Um, so here the goal is to keep your heart beating. And you can't keep it beating if you are sometimes slower in behavior than X, so you need to always meet a deadline. Always. There's no option of not doing it. Telling somebody that 99.9% .9 of the time you're going to meet the deadline is not going to make them happy. Okay? That's a terrible number when you're talking about your heart. So, you know, you're not going to live very long if that's what the, that were the case. And get averages, standard deviations, and being fast sometimes doesn't really help. It's not a goal even. Right? Um, so the worst case is the only thing that matters in these requirements. You have to measure it. Um, low latency trading or soft real time, this is common to old telco as well, but let's look at the motivation here. This has two goals often. One is to be fast enough to make some good plays, to, to, to actually win sometimes. Um, but the other one is to contain the risk or the exposure of of, of doing plays and then freezing in the middle and being exposed to big market fluctuations. 
Um, so we typically want to be fast enough in the typical, but we also say that we can't afford to be you know, trading and holding a market position for a really long time when the market moves uh, without having planned for that eventuality. Um, so we want a very good typical or a very good 50th percentile or 90th percentile, but we also want very contained maxes or 99.9 .9 percentile. Soft real-time usually has that common commonality of both speed and outlier containment uh, requirements. We go on to interactive applications. I like to call this squishy real-time. That's, you know, humans are squishy. Um, and, and here you basically are very relaxed compared to the other applications, but you still have requirements. You want to keep your users happy enough so they won't complain or won't leave your website or, or you know, th they need to be happy enough and productive enough, but it's okay to not be perfect all the time. Um, usually you'd say, I want typical snappy behavior when it's a human response time application. It's okay to sometimes be slow, but not too often and not too long. And this would be a common example of, of a common day application requirement. The 98th percentile needs to be really good. The 99.9 .9 percentiles are even, you know, fairly reasonable. And you have some cap on you should never see something bigger than X. That's, that's bad. Um, you need to remember that when you think of human response time, humans interact with the systems more than once. And they usually do it through systems that have a lot of round trips for one interaction. So one web page usually has many different requests going in, so something being slow could affect the entire web page. Um, so usually you're dealing with hundreds of interactions for one session. And if one of those hundreds is very bad, that user has seen a very bad behavior. You need to remember that when you're calculating your percentiles. 99.9% .9 of operations is not does not mean one in a thousand users has seen that. It's probably one in ten. So when we establish requirements, I like to go through a process of kind of interviewing either myself or somebody else and trying to figure out what we actually need. This is often very hard to do because people tend to be very resistive to actually saying what they need. Um, and I'll walk through a simple example of a question and answer session for this. So it usually starts with, what's your latency requirement? And usually the answer is, I want good latency. Um, or here, you know, I want the average response to be 20 milliseconds. That's what I want from the system. So the next question is, okay, I usually translate average to mean typical. Because <coughs> averages are usually no more meaningful than standard deviation. <coughs> Sorry. Um, but then I ask, okay, what's the worst case? What am I allowed to do? And the typical answer is, we don't have one. We haven't. We don't talk about that, or I don't want to think about it. So the way I usually try and get a worst case out of people is I say, okay, so it's okay for me to take five hours every once in a while, right? There's always a no. And then if they say no, I say, okay, let me write down, cannot take five hours. And they say, no, 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 no. Change that to 100 milliseconds. I'm going to cough a little bit here in just a second. I'm going to turn off the mic so you don't hear that. OK, is this better? Yeah. Had too much espresso this morning. <coughs> so. Usually the reaction is an overreaction, and you have to negotiate them back, saying, I'm talking about the worst case, not all the time. So what can you really handle? And they'll back off. You'll get a reasonable number, like a two-second kind of thing. It depends on the application, obviously. Now, the next thing you do is you say, OK, I have a typical requirement. I have a worst case requirement. Um, how often is it OK to be somewhere in the middle? And at this point, you usually have an annoyed person on the other side because you've asked them too many questions. They say, I think we covered that. Um, you said, you know, the worst case won't happen very often. They say, yeah, the worst case won't happen very often, but half the worst case can happen. Can I do it a thousand times a day? Can I do it a million times a day? How often am I allowed to do it? And um, at that point, usually you get 
you get them to think of an actual set of requirements. An example would be something like that. Statement of actual, this is what I need for that percentile. And this needs to usually be driven by business needs or actual application needs. It shouldn't be a technical thing that drives this. It's what are we willing to actually accept, considering what it means to the application or what it means to risk or what it means to failure. So those are, that's an example of deriving these. Now, latency alone doesn't just live on its own. Latency depends on other things, and it does depend on load. Remember this graph? It's not that load dominates the behavior of it. There are many modes and behavior to it, but load does strongly affect it. And under load, the system will collapse. Now, usually, if you're looking at a benchmark, this is what the benchmark will tell you. This is what marketing will tell you. Tell you. The system can do this much because it can. Um, but at this point, your users are screaming at you. And that's the point where a system administrator asks for more hardware, because they don't want the users to be screaming at them. And, and those are very different points. Right? You need to be aware of that. There's the good range, and there's the bad range. And usually, operations is about staying away from the bad range. Now, when we measure throughput in the lab, a mistake I often see is that people will just see how fast can this thing go driving for that you know, marketing number. But that number is usually meaningless, because unless you know whether or not you've passed or met your requirements, how fast you can go is not very useful. So we've talked about how to establish requirements. A simple example of being fast but not very useful is this. Okay. I mean, it's really fast until it crashes. And, and if your goal is to not crash, then the question is, how fast can I go without crashing, not how fast can I go right before I hit the wall. Right? That's not an interesting number to measure, but that's the number I see most people measuring in labs. They will take the system and run it to breaking point and derive a number from that, where at the breaking point, if they actually measured their latencies and response time, they would have found that they're so far out of requirement range that it's a meaningless number. The real question is, how far can I go and I'm still meeting my business needs? To give you an example of, well, let's skip that. An example of that, and this is a way we often compare our product against other products, is this is an example of how far we can push a portal application, in this case it's LiveRay on JBoss, um, such that it meets this requirement, this, this line of service level expectations. And as you can see, at this point, it almost crosses it, but it still passes, so it's a good system. Now, in this case, we could stuff about 45 concurrent users into a 3 gigabyte heap of an application. It doesn't really matter what that is. But basically, that's as far as we could go while meeting the requirements. The system had room for a lot more. In fact, you can drive this thing at 10 times or even more that rate. But it would break the basic SLA, which is why people won't do that, and sysadmins won't run that way. Now, the way we compare that with Zing, our product, is we'll say, OK, take the same system and let's measure it and keep driving it, and if the response time stays nice and flat, and we can drive very far away from requirements at a much higher rate, we've shown that we could do better. Now, this is the same hardware, and that hardware could carry the same capacity from a throughput perspective, but when the question is how much throughput can you carry and still meet your SLAs, the answers differ quite a bit. And by the way, when we do that, the way we achieve those kind of numbers is by cheating. We actually use all the memory in the system, or half the memory in the system, because we can do it without pausing, so we don't get bad SLAs. But that's the technical how. From the measurement perspective, we could demonstrate whether or not you can carry more load that meets requirements, as opposed to whether or not you can carry more load, which are two very, very different questions. So let's talk about this coordinated emission problem I talked about. Um, now, I call this an accidental conspiracy. It's not that somebody means to erase numbers in your data sets. But unfortunately, common measurement techniques tend to produce this behavior. So let's talk about how this happens, or how to achieve this coordinate emission. Usually, you start off by building or buying some sort of a load generation tool. And the load generation tool has one or more client things, and the clients issue requests get responses, measure the interval between them, and log results. And then they'll do some sort of math on that. 
whether it's standard deviation computation, which is usually wrong, or actual good percentile characterization, they'll take that and, and they'll produce reports from it, right? Now, what's wrong here? Because it's a pretty standard, self-evident way to do things. This technique only works as long as each and every request that you issue takes shorter amount of time than the interval you would have taken between two requests. The minute your system breaks that line, your measurement system usually reacts. And it reacts by backing off. I've issued a request. I thought it would take 20 milliseconds. It took five seconds. Well, when it comes back, I'll issue another request. But during that time, I've got no measurements. And that affects results. Now, often people say, yeah, I'll miss a few results, so come on, how big of a deal is it? I mean, there'll be a little bit of noise, and there's a period of time where I didn't sample things. But remember that you're trying usually to set requirements in percentiles, and often the percentiles that matter are 99 or 99.9 .9 percentile type things, so you can dramatically affect those results, what, what you think the number is, by dropping the bad results. Let's use an actual example or hypothetical system here. Imagine a perfect system where it can handle 100 requests a second without any variance, and every request that you ask comes back in perfect one millisecond response time. Now we'll take this system and freeze it for 100 seconds, 100 seconds after we started it. So I'll just stop it for some reason. You know, I'll manually stop it. And the question here is not, is this a good or bad system? But how would you describe the system in order to ask whether or not it meets requirement and how it stands? So let's, as human beings, go through this, okay? Very simply. Um, on the left-hand side, we have a pretty simple scenario. For 100 seconds, the average was one millisecond. On the right-hand side, we also have a very simple scenario. It was frozen, it did nothing for 100 seconds. On the average, if I asked the question there, it would have taken 50 seconds for it to answer. Those are very simple ways of describing the system without measurement. You know, this is what the system does. The average of those two over the entire 200 second period of time is 25 seconds. If I repeated that pattern, that would be the correct average for how this system would behave if I randomly asked it a question at some point. On the average, I'd get a 25 second response time. Here's some more stats. The 50th percentile is still at the one millisecond level, but then it grows very fast. Obviously, the 75 percentile is halfway through this, and it's pretty clear that the 99.99 .99 percentile is really bad and very close to the freeze we're actually doing. This would be the way we should describe it to ourselves, to our boss, to our customer. That's what this system is doing. So let's apply measurement to the system with something like a J-meter. So we run here, and on the left, we've got 10,000 results, each coming back with one millisecond. And then on the right, we have one result that takes 100 seconds. That's what the system sees, right? And then we do math. So let's do math. That's what comes out. And whether it's the average or the, the standard deviation or the 90th percentile, they're all wrong. And they're wrong not because it's the wrong question to ask, it's because the data is wrong. We basically ignored half the data. And not, we didn't just ignore the random half of the data. We took all the bad results and erased them. And then we did math. That's the coordinated omission part of it. It's not just omission of data. It's omission of data that's coordinated with the bad behavior. What should actually have been done is, you know, on the right, we should have as many results measured as on the left because we're talking about an uncoordinated attempt to look at the system. And if we did that, we'd get correct math. I mean, the math would work out to be what we would expect the system to behave like. So this is a real problem. Now, I amplified it by describing a pretty outrageous scenario, but it happens in very real tools. So this is output from JMeter exhibiting that problem. Not quite the scenario I had, but a 50% duty cycle uh, uh, type of system. This is what it produces on normal tools without any effect, completely lying to you about this system. You give it a known system, it'll tell you that's how it behaves. And that's true not just for JMeter, it's true for Grinder, it's true for HP Load Runner, 
So we're pretty much all low generators on the industry that I know of, and that's unfortunate. Um, if you correct the data and you feed it back into JMeter, you can see the actual distribution there, which is, you know, that's how the system we built is, is, is there. But again, these are artificial systems, right? I'm, I'm demonstrating a problem by amplifying it. So let's look at some actual, you know, real world things. So real world meaning a benchmark. <coughs> In this case, uh, this is the YCSB benchmark. This is the benchmark most people use to measure key value pair performance, like memcache and other and, and, and HBase. Um, it, it's a it's a common benchmark in use. And this is output from it where I, without looking inside the benchmark, I can tell that there's this problem going on. Sometimes we're lucky enough to be able to tell. In this case, it's a single client. So one thread was doing all the requests. Um, we can see that there was a 26 second freeze in the system during the benchmark, because the maximum is that. And we know there's only one client, so the entire system was frozen for that amount of time at some point. We can also see that you know, there's a 99th percentile being reported there. But if we do the math, we can figure out that the 99th percentile has to be at least 0.29%. This 1.29% of the time minus the 1% for 99%, it has to be at least that big, which would have been 5.9 seconds. But this benchmark is reporting a 5 millisecond 99th percentile on the same data set. It's at least 1,000x wrong and then use the benchmark to decide how to size your system and how to build your system and what to buy, right? So it's just garbage data that then you then make business decisions based on. Another good example, real world benchmark, is the SpecJ App Server benchmark. Uh, this is actually from the website, a world record result from, I think, 2011. Um, and it's got some pretty nice numbers there. The requirement for the benchmark, by the way, is a 90th percentile that meets these numbers. As you can see, the 90th percentile easily meets those numbers, almost by an order of magnitude, right? System was doing 9,000 transactions a second as it was doing it. It's very happy. You can see your average and your standard deviation there, which I told you what that means. Now, this benchmark also happens to result another, uh, report another column that's not actually um, required, but for some reason they put it up there, and this is that column. It's the maximum. And what you can see in here is that the system, this is a one hour test. It was completely frozen for five minutes out of the hour. We have maximums of 300 seconds across the board for multiple types of operations. So at least a big component of the system was completely dead for five minutes out of an hour. That's 8.4% of the wall clock time. Now, I can't quite say from that that these numbers are wrong because theoretically, you know, you could still have that 90th percentile with that behavior, but it just shows you how far away from reality the benchmark requirements are in this benchmark scenario is. You know, usually when people say, I've got a 90th percentile requirement and nothing else, I point out that they probably are not okay with 10% failure. If 10% if if of things were never happened, or like here, 10%, 8% of things took five you know, five minutes, that would probably be considered failure. But when you set your requirements to ignore that, you get this, a benchmark that reports a really good number. Um, by the way, that number is 762 standard deviations away from the mean, and that tells you how, how, how good standard deviation is. It would take millions of Big Bang events before that result would be possible on a normal distribution. And this was one hour. Another good example, this is from an actual customer, uh, an e-commerce site, payment system. Um, before correction and after correction on a data set, um, coordinated emission actually happened there. And this is the full percentile distribution, which is how I like to look at data. The requirements don't need to have that many percentiles, but it's good to see the behavior of percentile. And while both of these graphs have these nice peaks in them, this customer was measuring a requirement for 99.9%. .9%. And at that requirement point, there was a 7x difference in the actual business case results between measuring correctly and measuring wrong. Their requirement was less than one second. So they thought they were passing, they were actually miserably failing, which means that their lab system said everything's okay, but their customers were complaining. <coughs> 
So let's look at suggestions from, from here. Um, whatever your measurement technique is, test it, and test it against a hypothetical system. Not just against your system. Take your measurement system and measure a known scenario, an artificial scenario that you've created, and see whether or not the system actually describes the scenario back to you. Unless your system can describe reality to you, its numbers are meaningless. So create a known reality, not your actual software system, but a completely artificial one. It's pretty simple to do, you know. Control Z is a very useful tool. Or a complete freeze of a system that's intentional is a very useful tool. And if your system comes back and describes the distribution that you can do on paper, then you, you, you've established some trust in it. But before you've done that, assume that it's wrong. As I said, eight out of 10 measurement systems that I've seen include this kind of mistake. Um, don't waste your time analyzing any result unless you've established a sanity check. You're looking at garbage. It's a waste of time. Never, ever, ever use standard deviation to describe latency distribution. I know this might sound controversial, but I have never seen a software system where the standard deviation, where the max was less than five standard deviations away from the typical. And unless you meet that system, the standard deviation is meaningless. And I'd say that if you do meet that system, it's a really good system and, and you don't even need the standard deviation at that point. Always measure the max time. It's the one thing that nobody can ever cheat on. You, you, you can't get wrong statistics for max, right? So always measure it because it's usually your number one warning sign that something is weird. It's far away from other numbers. Consider it. People have the tendency to throw it away. Do the opposite. And then measure percentiles, as many of them as you can practically do. And remember, this isn't the requirement for percentiles, but the measurement of them. So let's look at some examples of how to measure percentiles. And we're running a little tight on time because of that restart. I'm going to come a little close to, to the end here. So uh, I've actually put up a tool I call HDR Histogram. This is open source Java code that you can use to produce pictures like this, which you've seen in this presentation a few times. They're a continual percentile graph that you measure, and all you have to do is record your values in it, and then it'll use it at the end. It's, like I said, it's, it's, it's open source, but it's also designed for high dynamic range uh, recording, which is what you need to actually measure percentiles. The example would be you could tell it to cover the range from a microsecond to an hour with three decimal points of resolution or two decimal points of resolution. You tell it what the resolution needs to be. And it builds the right structure for it. Uh, it also has built-in uh, correction for coordinated emission if you tell it what the interval expected is. So you can record your values right, or you could tell it this is the value I saw, and I expected to see a result every x interval, so please recreate all the missing ones for me. Um, it's open source, as I said. I won't get into how it's built internally, but it kind of looks like a big floating point number, like tens of kilobytes of representation for that. Uh, and like I said, it's all open source, so you can look at how it's built. It also gives you iteration tools by percentiles, by logs, by linear, which means that you could do very interesting output. And it's got tools that produce output like this. This is just a text dump of the percentiles, a very dense one that covers from 0 to 99% in this range, or whatever it is. But it'll run it to completion, to 100%. And you can take that data and produce this kind of picture from it pretty easily. So it produces the data with very few data points, only 100 data points for this graph or so. but. It's constant time, constant space. You can record a trillion results in it without it growing and without it getting slower in Java, without it ever allocating an object, actually, and then see what the results are. You can use it for your whole system. You can use it for intervals in the system. It's just a good way of looking at the range of percentiles. A good example of this in actual use is something, uh, another tool I've put up that's called jhiccup. This is used to just document the incontinuities of execution in Java systems. Uh, this is an example picture of it, but what it basically does is it measures whether or not your JVM was even running. And as it runs, um, it measures any hiccups that it could see. The hiccups don't have anything to do with your application, but if it saw hiccups, so did your application at the same time. Uh, it's open source as well, and it produces pictures like this. 
At the top, you have hiccups by time interval. So any hiccup that happened in an interval. At the bottom, you have the distribution. And you can plot an optional SLA or requirement set on there. So it's a nice picture. Now, this is the last part where, as I said, I'll do some bragging. Uh, this is the real reason I built jhiccup. Um, Charles Nutter is the JRuby guy. He correctly called why I did this. Um, it's because I can use it to show my product off against others, because it's usually hard to get good measurements. So this is an example of that. On the left, you have regular Oracle hotspot, and on the right, you have Zing for the same application. Now, visually, can you see how much better Zing is? Probably not, because the numbers are really small, but the scales matter. Okay? On the left, we have a 12-second scale. On the right, we have a 20-millisecond scale. If I actually scale them correctly, it looks like this. And the reason I first show you the other picture is really hard to show how good you are when you're a 1,000 times better on something and there are 500 pixels in a picture. Um, but it's a simple before-after. If that's how you behave now and you want to behave like that, that's what Zing is for. And it's good for both squishy real-time and you know that, that low latency kind of real-time. Um, this is the exact same kind of scenario on a low latency system uh, where you know, on the left you have a 20 or 30 millisecond kind of hiccup. And again, if we scale this correctly, it looks like that. So Zing is basically about eliminating hiccups in Java or dramatically dropping them. And when I say dramatically, I mean three orders of magnitude kind of dramatically. So let's get to the takeaways because we really ran the time out. Um, standard deviation. Um, should never be, never be used to describe latency. Okay, I hope if there's one takeaway you come out of here with is stop using it. Because uh, let's be honest for a second. How many of you currently have or recently have used standard deviation in the description of latency? Okay, a few of you. So stop. Okay, uh, or you know what? You can keep it there. But make sure to see if it's sane or not. And every time it's not sane, just mark it off. Okay? Let's see how much that happens. Now, if you, if you uh, haven't stated in your requirements percentiles and an absolute worst case, you haven't yet stated your requirements. Like I said, the simple test is, is it OK for it to take five days? If not, we've established that there's a worst case requirement of five days. So write it down. And then you know, sanity check that. You'll get a different number. Um, Measuring throughput without latency behavior and without checking requirements is a meaningless test. I hope you picked that up. And the mistakes that you can do in measurements will dramatically affect your business decisions if you don't sanity check them. So sanity check your actual testing systems. Last, you know, jhiccup and HDR histogram, you can find them on the web, and they're both pretty useful tools, and, and the Zing JVM is a pretty cool product. So that's it for me.